Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Keep Arizona Wild video cast. I am your host, Clint Culberson, coming to you from the rainy deserts of the, Sonor the, the Sonoran Desert down here in, in Gilbert, Arizona. Uh, and today, I am really excited to bring on a guest, Dr. Sylvester Allred, who is... Uh, was was a professor at the uh, Northern Arizona University up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and had has written a book that I picked up this past summer, uh, going up to the mountains a lot. And I was in the bookstore and I saw on the shelf this book called The Big Pine of the Southwest, and it was it was all about ponderosas, uh, and I had no choice but to take uh, to buy that book. And developed a, quite a relationship with this book, and I'm so excited to have you on, Sylvester. Thank you for coming on. Glad I could be here. Yeah, thanks, man. And uh, any, I think for anybody who spends a lot of time up in in the mountains of Arizona, specifically since our our channel is is very Arizona focused, but really anywhere in the Western North America where where these beautiful trees, these iconic trees, as I always call them. Uh, where they exist, and I, I think uh, so many people are spending so much time with them, yet know so little about them. And uh, maybe I, I just kind of wanted to start where, with where your infatuation with the trees came from, and uh, how it all started for you. My research in uh, northern Arizona started in 1985, when I got involved with a tassel-eared squirrel ecological project and they are indigenous to the Ponderosa pine forest. And so that's how I got involved with pine trees, Ponderosas specifically, and the tassel-eared squirrels. And so I was there for 27 years and spent a lot of time, years in fact, if you start counting the hours, in the forest in Northern Arizona and up on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, studying the squirrels and their interactions with the Ponderosa. So just to finish up on that, I, I wrote a book on the natural history of tassel-eared squirrels, and it just seemed to me that I should go ahead and do one on the ponderosa pine. And it morphed, instead of doing a natural history of the ponderosa pine, I wanted to do something more for the public, the lay public. So you could take this little book and put it in your hip pocket, backpack, get out in the woods, start walking around, sauntering around, as John Muir said, and actually encounter things in the forest. And here, this book will explain them to you. That's how that got started. Yeah, awesome. You know, and you, you, the purpose of your book uh, lived on through me and my own group of friends. I mean, this past summer, every summer, a group of my friends and I, we do a gathering up in the up near uh, uh, Bear Canyon Lake, uh, near Woods Canyon Lake in, in the Sit Greaves uh, Forest. And uh, I had been reading that book and decided to do like a mini presentation on what I'd found in the in your book. And we had about, you know, th 25 of us walking around the woods and I collected my notes and I was the, you know, I was the uh, Professor Allred for our group and, and just sharing the information that I had learned from the book and so many of us learned so much. and. Uh, um, it was, you know, it was, it was your book in action. So, and then a couple months later, here we are, I start this YouTube channel and now we're talking. I wanted to ask you, um, to kind of just start off with describing what the range of the Ponderosa is and how long these trees have been there because they haven't always been here, you know, during the evolution of our own planet. It's, it, they've, they've in some ways a Johnny come lately. I and mean, obviously human beings are even more so that, but can you kind of just describe the range that they, that they have here in North America and then also their, their history? The range of the Ponderosa extends up into Canada and all the way down into uh, Northern Mexico. Uh, obviously they're not contiguous in all those areas, but mm. at certain elevations is where you find them between five and 8,000 feet. And they've been around since the Pleistocene. Mm. You know, we, the Ice Age came through about 50,000 years ago, roughly. And, and um, these trees started to appear and get into this area uh, after the ice sheets were receding. Now, so are we talking 10, are we, now there was, there was an Ice Age about 10,000 years ago, if I'm correct, but we're not talking that. We're talking even further back than that. Yeah, I think further back than that, sure. So when um, when would the end of the Pleistocene, you know, occur more or less? When is the agreed upon time period? 
Oh, that's a good question. I think there's uh, various various answers to that, but I would think in the last um, we've been out of that about fifteen thousand years. So wow, wow, incredible. Um, and if you if you know if someone were to come to North America and they were hanging out with you and we we drove up on we drove up to Flagstaff and said what the heck's in that forest? I mean, can you? Can you just describe to anyone who's uninitiated uh, as to what the heck is going on in these forests in terms of the flora and fauna that you might see beyond the ponderosas? And now again, the ponderosa is the predominant. When we talk about a pon ponderosa forest, that's the predominant tree species within that forest, correct? That, that's that what is we're correct. About. Yeah. So you would find some other trees associated in the ponderosa pine forest. If you're on the edge of the elevational gradient, around say 5,000, you would find some PJ, pinion juniper. And as you get up a little higher, say around 8,000, 7,500 to 8,000 feet elevation, you start getting into the spruce and fir. So on those margins, you would find some trees that are on both sides of that elevational gradient. Mm -hmm. However, in that, in that specific range, the predominant vegetation is going to be ponderosa. And in fact, um, from the book, Miriam, when Miriam was in northern Arizona in late 1800, late 1800, he um, noticed that and he started naming his life zones after the predominant vegetation. And Ponderosa happened to be between five and seven thousand, and he named that the transition zone. Mm -hmm. But it was predominantly Ponderosa pine. So when you get into the forest, there are many different forms of life that live there. Some are obviously apparent deer, elk, <clears throat> various birds, raptors, but there's a lot of things going on in that forest floor. And you just have to get down on your hands and knees and start crawling around and turning over some of that duff. And you start seeing a myriad of various insects that are down there eating on the decomposing litter and turning it back into the nutrients that the soil will gather in and the trees will take back up. So trees are just storage places for nutrients hmm. and carbon specifically. And I'm not sure we'll get into that very much, but these trees sequester a lot of carbon. And the more carbon we can sequester, the better the, better the atmosphere is going to be for us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, when and, you know, like you said, maybe that's a topic for another time. But no, there's no doubt we, I talk about it on this channel that how. You know, planting trees is one of the best tools in our in our tool belt as human beings in terms of counteracting the the climate change that we're experiencing. No matter what you your opinions are on climate change, there are definitely changes happening as to wh who what causes them. That can we can discuss that another time. But at a minimum, we have to realize that there's a warming and a drying taking place, especially here in the south in the western United States. Uh, and you know planting trees is a, is a human uh, action in, in terms of how we can counterbalance that is it seems to be one of the best things that we can do so there's no doubt about it um, I wanted to ask you about uh, how big these ponderosas can get for anyone who doesn't know or even someone who's, who's used to being around them but has no idea you know any scale of of height how big do they get? How old do they live? And what are the differences between the yellow bellies and the blackjacks? And if you could kind of, I know that's a lot there, but maybe you kind of go over, go over these, these big giants. Sure. <clears throat> now, they can approach 300 feet in height. So hmm. very tall trees and they can get up to be five or so feet in diameter. Wow. Uh, so big trees. And we find some of the bigger trees on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. But as far as age, around uh, northern Arizona, it's, it would not be um, common, but you could find some trees that are in the four to 600-year-old range. And in Utah, the oldest tree uh, that's been known is over 950 years old. But that's an outlier there. Yeah. As far as the black jacks what and would, the yellow... So, Lester, what would you say then would be the average for the uh, average lifespan of a, of a ponderosa? If 900 is the outlier, where would where does the, the, the average tree probably end up? 
Well, if these trees were allowed to grow and were not interrupted with fire and uh, beetles and things like that and had plenty of space to grow, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 400 years would be a good average span. Of course, lightning takes out a lot of trees. These trees act as, as lightning rods. And um, so they may be very old and may be struck more than once. So just mm-hmm. being struck by lightning does not necessarily kill the tree. Right. Right. We can talk about that a little bit if you want later. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And lightning is a uh, and lightning and beetles are, are a, b- a big part of their life, so there's no doubt about it. Well, you were going to jump into what this these terms yellow bellies and blackjacks are, which kind of correlate uh, with their age. So if you could kind of discuss the differences between that, because in the, in the forest. Sometimes these ponderosas look a little different and, you know, some have this orange bark all over them and some of them just seem way darker. And what, what the heck's going on here, Sylvester? Well, as you just said, it has to do with age and it also has to do with diameter. So when they get to be about 18 inches at DBH diameter, they start turning, the bark starts turning kind of a, a reddish orange in color and the plates of the bark start getting longer and wider. And at one time, it was thought that these were two different types of trees, even though they had the same needles and that kind of thing, and they were located in the same areas, people thought they were two different species. And then, of course, um, lots of different science and studies showed that they were definitely the same tree, but they just, as they mature in age, they start to change color. And... um, you don't have to necessarily be a large tree to turn because it could be age too. So you may be a, you may find a tree that has a smaller diameter, but also starts to turn yellow. And it has to do with its age also, not just the diameter of the tree. Mm-hmm. So when they, when they do turn that, that uh, reddish orange in color, the bark is very thick. And of course, these trees involve with fire. And that thick bark certainly does help protect them from a fast moving fire, mm-hmm. not not a sustained fire. It will burn through the bark eventually. Right. Can you talk about uh, the strategy that the tree has in terms of pruning itself? Sure. Ponderosa pines are, are considered to be self pruning trees. And as they grow taller, the needles on the lower branches are not carrying their load in photosynthesis. In other words, they're taking more in from the tree than they're producing for the tree. So the tree starts to lose those needles, those limbs. And then eventually the limbs have no more needles to um, be uh, active. And so eventually the limbs just fall off or die and eventually will fall off. Mm -hmm. If, If you find a ponderosa that is isolated, no competition around it, you'll find limbs all the way, well, within within reach of the ground mm. as it grows in its um, triangular shape. Yeah, almost more like a spruce or, you know, Christmas yes. tree style, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And then if, if trees are in what, there's a lot of competition around, the branches that are growing on the side next to or adjacent to the other ponderosas will actually... Um, be dropped. And that's mm. referred to as flagging. Because mm. the tree has more branches and needles on one side than it does on the other. Now, with very large ponderosas, you can notice that at the top of the tree, it starts to almost go lateral, like it doesn't keep going and it starts to flatten out almost like a little perch. Can you explain what the heck's going on with those trees? Those trees have stopped growing tall. They're now going to put their their energies into growing uh, thicker, bigger diameter limbs and trunk, but they're not going to continue to grow upward. Mm. So that's a very good question. It's a really good observation to make as you're walking around in the forest. If you see a group of trees and some of them have nice triangular points on them, they're still actively growing tall. Mm. Whereas if you see the flattened, as you described, um, they, they've stopped growing upward. Now, not mm-hmm. to say that they wouldn't grow an inch or two here and there, and it could be measured, but they're not actively growing up yeah. any longer. As we talk about the age of trees, 
um, how just because a tree is small doesn't necessarily mean it's a young tree. So I wanted you to kind of discuss where those circumstances might arrive, where we might see a smaller tree, but yet this thing could be way old. Oh, and then also, d can you talk to us about what dog thickets are? Because I know anyone who spent time in, the, you know, in, the, in, a, in a Ponderosa forest, they probably see dog thickets. They just don't know what they're called, and they don't know exactly what they are and why the heck they're happening. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, especially around Flagstaff going uh, north, there are uh, on the sides of the highway some very thick groves of very spindly ponderosas. And you can get out and it's very difficult to even walk through them. And they were described as dog hair thickets. Hmm. And these, these started growing about 1910. There was a tremendous seed year that year from the records we have. And mm. there was a lot of moisture. And so a lot of germination occurred. And all these trees grew. Of course, as they grow, they're competing with the, their neighbors for nutrients and sunshine and space. And they couldn't, they couldn't grow larger, so they just grew taller. But they're very, very spindly, almost like straws. Mm -hmm. But if you do studies of the cores of these trees, they're in the neighborhood of a of 90 to 100 years old. Hmm. <clears throat> it looks so, like a, it looks like a nursery, like baby trees. So that's what I think people does. get confused about. Yes. So if you have a really wet year and lots of seeds, you're going to have a lot of trees that will germinate. And if you don't have anything that comes through and disrupts that growth, like frost, animals grazing, fire, you will have these dog hair thickets occurring. And 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 they can be dangerous to the forest because they act as ladders mm. of fire up into the branches of the taller trees and the older trees, bigger mm. trees. Where, where are some other situations where a, a smaller tree might be older than you think? I'm not sure I understand your question now. Now, I mean, uh, so oh. where, where might you find smaller ponderosas that are actually deceptively much older than they look, if that makes sense? Oh, sure. Especially on ridge lines uh, where they, there's a lot of stressful wind and colder weather and or hotter uh, temperatures because they're up on the ridge of a, of a range of mountains where there's not as much moisture or there's a lot of snow. The trees could be much older than they appear. If you were, you'd have the only way to determine that would be to do a core, a yep. core set of those trees. Hmm. Um, sp and speaking of uh, the core of the tree, I was wondering. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that goes into this, but if you know, and obviously, it'd be great. It'd be much better if you were in front of like a PowerPoint. Uh, but can you kind of go through the the general anatomy of these trees? And do they share what differences they have with maybe other pines or are they very similar? But, you know, can you talk about the anatomy of the ponderosa? Sure. I think that's a really good thing to do because most people who, who haven't had a lot of science courses, when they see a tree, they, they look at that tree and, and they marvel at it, of course, as we all do. But they don't realize that right beneath the bark, is the living tissue of the tree. So the tree may be huge, but its living part is just a tissue paper thin layer cylinder that runs from the roots all the way up to the top of the tree. And if you remove the bark, in other words, girth the tree, mm -hmm. you don't have to you don't have to cut the tree down. You just have to remove the bark all the way around. And right beneath the bark is the living part of the tree. And it's very thin. And that's where water is coming up from the roots. And that's where nutrients that the tree is producing, the sugar that's produced from photosynthesis, that is being transported down through the tree and into the roots. So if you cut that all the way around, as beavers do when they girth the tree, mm. then the tree will die because the circulation system has effectively been cut off. Mm. So the middle part of the tree is dead tissue. Completely dead. That's why you see hollow trees and animals use those for dens. And the, so the tree is still alive, although it may be hollow. 
Hmm. Because there's nothing living inside that tree. Yeah, I, I kind of see it like like roadways going up and down. And if you if you you know the idea of uh, girdling a tree, uh, you know you do a circle around it, and you cut all the highways, then it's Donsville. I mean, it's kind of it's even though you exactly can chop right. out half of it, if you left a couple of the highways, then it'll still go, keep going. It's pretty interesting how that's a great. It's a, actually a great way to really understand and see what's taking place with these very slow moving creatures. I mean, they seem seemingly trees uh, seem inanimate to the human eye because we're operating on such a different timetable. But uh, when you when you when you see that out in the woods, if you ever see a circle cut around it and then the tree's dead, it's like really drives it home. Wow. OK, so this really, you know, I'm not just reading it in a book. I'm really seeing it. It's pretty it's, it's pretty amazing. You remember back uh, in certain parts of California, some of the redwoods, they actually cut tunnels through the tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And cars could drive through and people marveled at that. And the tree's still alive because it's still got the, the xylem and the phloem. Those two highways that you referred to are still intact in those parts of the trees that were not cut. So water and nutrients are still flowing. So when, when, when the, the pine needle receives sun and the photosynthesis process is, takes place, what, what is going on from there? Well, in that needle, which is green because it has chlorophyll, the chlorophyll and the carbon dioxide, the gas in the atmosphere, and the water is coming up from the roots, all those three things are interacting with sunlight, which is the energy source, and then from that, oxygen is produced as a waste product. And that's, of course, what we use to breathe. Now, trees also have to respire. So trees also use oxygen. Just because they produce it doesn't mean they also don't use it. But the product that it is then produced is called glucose. And if you take two glucose molecules and hook them together, you have table sugar. Mm. <laughs> and then... And then if you continue to hook those molecules together in these long chains, you eventually produce cellulose, which is what wood is made up of. Mm -hmm. And that's a tree hmm. or wood that we use in, in, our, in our homes and uh, other industries to make. Is, this, is the cellulose like the, like the fingernails on the human body and the hair kind of? I mean, is it uh, how... You know, when you talk about like that heartwood, the main the main core of the tree isn't even all the way really alive. No, it's uh, not. And so how, I'm trying to envision as this tree is getting older, how is it adding that matter to it? I mean, how, how does the living part then have like contribute to this, you know, the, the bulk mass of the tree, which is no longer living? Well, it, let me just see if I can describe it as... Um, going from the outside. So if we were just looking at the bark of a tree mm -hmm. and you went right beneath the bark with x-ray vision, mm -hmm. the first layer you would come to would be the layer that makes the bark. And it's a specific layer. It's called a cork cambium. Mm -hmm. And then right beneath that, if you're continuing to go into the tree, you'll encounter a tissue called phloem. I'm sorry, xylem. A phloem, excuse me. And then you hit vascular cambium and then you hit the xylem mm. and and then everything inside that tree is xylem which mm. is the water flowing tissues but keep in mind the middle part of the tree is dead mm. it's no longer active in terms of conducting any water at all mm. and it's basically a super highway from the needles down to the roots i mean there's a lot going on i, I can only imagine it is a super highway and that and they don't uh interfere with either one i mean it's they're completely um isolated can you talk about the life cycle of the ponderosa seed and how they they propagate themselves throughout the forest i mean what from from see from when those seeds first when do the seeds start uh, the pine cones first start to come to come to be and then what is their life cycle early in the spring uh, if you're out walking around and notice some low hanging branches, you'll see these little tiny buds, little greenish buds on the end of um, a terminal branch. And then in May to June, you'll see some different color 
little cones called pollen cones. They're the male cones. The first ones I've referred to are female cones. And that's why all that yellow dust is in the air during May, June, and it lands everywhere, but it's pollen. Hmm. And then the pollen, of course, is landing on the little conelets. And then the pollen eventually gets into the areas where the eggs are. And the egg is fertilized by the pollen, the, the sperm in the pollen. And then the seed develops. And then over the next 26 months, it takes that long for the seeds to mature in those cones. And the cones are growing bigger and they're very uh, packed, hard packed. I mean, they're closed. They have a lot of prickles on them to, for protection from some animals to eat them. They have a lot of resin in them that also is a protective um, chemical to keep uh, predation down, cone predation. And then about October, those cones, if they haven't been damaged by anything, start to open up and the seeds then there are two seeds per brack. And a brack is just one of those little leaf-like structures on the cone. Two seeds there, and they wing out, and they kind of helicopter to the ground. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And it's, you said 26 months, so we're talking a two, two seasons for this to all happen. Yes, two years. Mm. And just uh, quickly referring to squirrels, squirrels like those green cones before they're opened. Mm. Because once they open, the seeds are gone. Ah. But those cones, but those cones contain a lot of energy when they're closed up. All those seeds, so squirrels can get in there, take a cone out, and they don't. They're not bothered by the prickles. They're not bothered by the resin, and they can take a cone apart in about sixty seconds. Wow, <laughs> pretty impressive to watch them take a cone apart. Yeah, I can only imagine. So uh, a, a well, fun thing to do then is to look at a cone and count the number of bracts mm -hmm. and then multiply it by two and you kind of get an idea of how many seeds might have been in the cone. Ah, fascinating. Now, in terms of uh, seed dispersal, how, you know, I want to kind of get into this uh, symbiotic relationship that the trees have with uh, fungus and mammals uh, in order for, you know, for them to thrive. Uh, but uh, before we even get into the, you know, the your your case study of the tassel eared squirrel uh, with with in the you know in the roots and the fungus, uh, t what role do mammals play in in dispersing those pine nuts? Well, <clears throat> the, as as the uh, cones open and the seeds are starting to be dispersed, the squirrel would not be involved in dispersing those seeds. It's it's too hard to pick up all those individual seeds and eat them. Mm -hmm. And every time you bend down, there's a predator looking over your back. Mm -hmm. So you want to take that whole package of seeds and eat it up in the tree or on a tree stop somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the animals that would disperse the pine seed once they have opened from the cones would be birds. Stellar jays would be an example. They will take individual seeds and then go cache them in different places. Mm -hmm. Mice, various voles, and other little small mammals that live in the in the forest mm -hmm. take seeds and cache them. And then those caches aren't always found, and they and the seeds could germinate from that. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So, sometimes, but one more oh, thing. Yeah, go ahead. If a squirrel takes a green cone, they don't always eat those green cones. They sometimes go down the tree and bury the whole cone in the ground. So if you bury that cone, it keeps it intact. In other words, it doesn't open up and disperse the seeds. Mm -hmm. So if you're walking through the forest, you may look down sometime and see a whole bunch of little tiny seedlings coming from a single point. Mm -hmm. There's a cone underneath there that a squirrel didn't find. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes I'll see uh, when walking around the Ponderosa Forest underneath a tree, you'll see a big pile of just like processed pine cones and and stuff, just nibbled down, and you know, but a huge pile sometimes. Are these usually a sign of where you know squirrel nests might be? Could be nests in that area, but usually it's, we call it a feed tree, uh -huh. and they'll they'll go in there and just pop off a cone and prop up, up against the trunk of the tree and, and eat that. And if you stand under the tree, it'll rain bracts on you, cone bracts. And then mm. you may even get a cone dropped on you. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of fun to see. So go ahead, if you wouldn't mind, talk about this symbiotic relationship between the ponderosa, or the fungus, and, and, the, and mammals, but specifically even the, uh, the, the tassel-eared squirrel, that's rela- this, this symbiotic relationship that they have with each other. Yeah, I, that, that's a really good topic, and, um, and we can just start with the tree. The tree, as it's growing, its roots are reaching out uh, past the drip line of the branches. And these surface roots, uh, just subterranean roots, very shallow, maybe three or four inches underground, they have in association with them a fungus. Now, when you say that word, people start saying, oh, that's not good. But this is good. Uh, they're called hypogeus, hypo being under, geus being ground, so underground fungi. And these are called false truffles, not the truffles that we would normally think about, that we would eat. But these truffles act like little sponges mm-hmm. and soak up water, store nitrogen, and then the tree roots are associated with that. And so the tree gets a little bit of water, gets some nitrogen, but the fungus gets something in return. It gets a, a little bit of that glucose that's produced by the tree during photosynthesis. So it's mutualistic. Both parties benefit. Neither one is harming the other. They're both getting something out of this relationship. Mm-hmm. But the only way those spores that are produced by the fungus can be dispersed since they're underground is to be able, something has to come along and dig those false truffles up, consume parts of it, and then move through the forest. And as they defecate, those spores are spread through other forests. Mm. Part. So the tree needs the fungus to help it grow and, and live. The squirrel needs the fungus for food source. And the fungus needs the tree and the squirrel to disperse its spores. Mm-hmm. So it's a nice little concise relationship. And it kind of goes along with John Muir's paraphrase saying that when you tug on one thing in nature, it pulls all the other ones along with it. Yep. Yeah, I think for for us human beings, what we can learn from that is, you know, I think most people, if you interviewed them, they would say, yeah, we probably need the trees uh, for our own survival. People get that connection, right? But a lot of people think that something as as you know small and and micro as a tassel-eared squirrel, you know, hey, if they go extinct, who cares? There's plenty of other things going on. I don't. Th- that's the thing where uh, most humans uh, we don't we don't see the, the the connected chain that our own survival is is linked to even some of these these smaller species that we don't know much about. And, uh, you know, you, you, in your, in, in the book, you, you so eloquently described that connection and that, uh, you know, the link between them. And I, I just, that's the thing I, if any, if anyone gets anything out of this interview, I hope it's this right here, this will be the, the five minutes that I hope you listen to, because it's, it's so vital that even from the fungus to the squirrel, uh, th- those two are, are essential for the tree, which is essential for us. So I, I, well, you know, I so appreciate you uh, in the book. Uh, you, you so, you know, you, you painted the picture so well. I have to say that picture, I hope you get a chance to display that picture. It's mm-hmm. in the book. Mm-hmm. I have a dear friend, Jack States, who's a mycologist. Mm-hmm. He drew that photo. Nice. He, he lives up in uh, Lander, Wyoming. Mm-hmm. Now, oh. he was re- he's a retired biology professor also. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Um. You spent, how many years did you say you spent studying the tassel-eared squirrel? 27 years. 27. Uh, you know, how would you sum up your 27 years of, of really observing uh, one animal, uh, one specific variety, you know, one subspecies of, in the squirrel family? Um, you know, what can we learn from these creatures? You know, it was a delightful career. And I still study the squirrels. I'm just not teaching any longer at the university. Mm-hmm. These squirrels are just probably the most handsome tree squirrel in North America. And I'm not the only one that feels that way. There have been others that have written about them that express the same view. And just seeing how they interact in the forest 
and how they benefit the trees and how they benefit the forest. Mm -hmm. Remarkable opportunity for me. And I'm so glad I was able to do that. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, that's a pretty neat career that you've had, my friend. I mean, most people could spend a lot of their life in a cubicle, you know, crunching numbers and you got to really be out there and, and seeing this, this just such a, you know, and there's not too many other people who can say that they've spent 27 years, uh, you know, observing these guys. And I, I, that's pretty amazing. Uh, in the, in, in the, in the, as we wrap this up, I, I kind of wanted you to just talk about, and I want to introduce man, human beings to the, the situation. And can you tell us what, uh, what humans have traditionally used ponderosas for and, uh, how they've really benefited our, you know, human civilization? Well, as there was that westward expansion, there was a need for timber and the ponderosa certainly provided that opportunity. It was it was plentiful, it was easy to get. And so many of the mine timbers, the railroad, cross ties, telephone poles, bridge timbers, all those things that went into building the structures that were necessary for more transportation or more exploration uh, of the West, mostly were supplied by Ponderosa hmm. pine. And, um, and there were train tracks that were built to haul these big logs to mills. There were loggers who were hired to go out and cut these trees. And you can still go out in the forest in some of the areas and see stumps of these trees that were cut 100, 150 years ago using cross-cut saws hmm. because the stumps would be up about two to three feet, depending on the height of the person persons using the cross-cut saws. Mm. Whereas today we just cut them flush to the ground. Right. So when you're out walking around, that's another thing to look for. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. And as, as we move into, you know, and seemingly like a new, a new potentially climactic era, um, what are the major threats to these forests? Cause I mean, I've, I've talked to, I just had an interview with Sandy Barr, who was the, is the head of the Sierra club who, you know, she's worried these forests might not even be here uh, a couple hundred years from now. And so if that's, is, is that the case? Do you see it as, as that much of a threat? And it, what are the major threats beyond even climate change uh, that, these, that these, pines, uh, these pine forests are going to be experiencing over the next couple hundred years? Clint, I think that's a really good question. And, and certainly on the continuum of the trees being here or not being here, that would be the extreme that they're not present. Mm -hmm. Uh, the climate change is really what's driving forest right now in terms of the drought that they're experiencing, the intensive fires that we're having, and the, and the fires will come. The timber is there. The fires will come. We can help reduce the impacts of the fire if we can thin the forest and remove some of that litter layer that's been accumulating for some places 50, 75 years. Mm. It's not been burned. But the beetles are a big issue too. And the beetles are here. They're here all the time. There's always beetles around. But when the trees are weakened because they're not getting enough moisture or they're heat stressed, then the beetles can overwhelm the tree's defenses because the tree can't make enough resin to block up the holes that the beetles produce. And therefore, the trees then are, are going to have their bowls, the trunks of the trees, girth, just like girthing a tree, but from the inside instead of the outside. That's what beetles do. They girth the tree yeah. and they kill them very quickly. Mm -hmm. So climate change is, is a big factor. And of course, fire. Those are the two big threats right now. Yeah. Uh, here in Arizona, we, uh, I, I, I want to say in the 90s, it was the rodeo fire. It was a big, massive one that just, I think, I want to say it was the largest uh, fire we've had on record here in the state. Uh, what they have found, though, is a lot of the trees that are growing back are more of the, ju of the juniper variety and that the ponderosas themselves aren't coming back uh, as abundantly. Do, can, do you know why that is and, and what can we attest that to? Well, there's those junipers probably have a lot of seeds that were brought in by animals who were cashing those seeds. And uh, the Ponderosa seed bank was probably just pretty much destroyed. And if you don't have seeds of trees in there to produce the seeds to be dispersed, you're not going to get that growth. Mm 
So it's going to have to be either uh, seeded from the air or hand planted to get those forests back. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, you know, I'll, I'll end with, with this, you know, you've talked about, you've talked about the human involvement in this, but you know, where, I guess I wanted to talk about at the very end of this all, where, what is your love for these trees and with these, these animals? And, uh, when next time someone's going out into the woods, uh, you know, give give the, give anyone listening something, uh, that they might be able, what they might want to ponder the next time they're walking underneath the boughs of large ponderosas. Well, the name Ponderosa comes from the word ponderous. They were so big that someone decided, David Douglas decided he wanted to call it the Ponderosa Pine. And when you get out walking in the forest, rather than just get from point A to point B in a certain amount of time, do something that John Muir suggested, saunter through the forest, take notice of what you see, ask questions. Why is this tree yellow and that one black? Why are these needles attached the way they are? How many needles are in a bundle? How do these trees smell? Get down on your knees, pull back that duff. Don't be ashamed, don't be bashful. Get down and, and just take your time and wander through the forest because each tree has a distinct personality just like we do. Yep, absolutely beautiful. And I, in fact, one of my motivations to start this channel was was over the past few years, I've been discovering that there's so many stories that are happening within these natural environments, these ecosystems that uh, they're not stories with words. Granted, that's what that's our part in this. But there's there's so much going on. And there's these, you know, just your story of the symbiotic relationship between the ponderosa, the f a fungus and a squirrel is is to me just beyond uh, fascinating. And I, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. And there's probably so much more to this story of the natural world that we are a part of that we do not understand. And, uh, it's, it's this great mystery that, uh, we're, we're unfolding and, you know, and it's because of books like yours and, and people like you who've, who've spent so much time, uh, looking at, you know, uh, uh, the a microcosm, uh, part of our world, which, and, and then being able to, uh, connect that with the macrocosm of this big world that we have. And I, I just, I can't commend you enough for the, for what you did. And anyone out there who, if you're going to be camping this summer underneath some ponderosas, uh, this is a must have book, the big pine of the Southwest. I mean, when your kids are out playing and you got 30 minutes to just read a book, uh, while you're laying down in your, in your, in your hammock, this is the book to read. Uh, and I, I just can't commit, I just can't recommend it enough. Um, so please pick it up and Sylvester, thank you so much for joining me. We'll have to have you back on again and talk more about these forests because they're just so important. And I, I my goal is to help, uh, find people like you to, who can help educate us, the people that are living on the land so that we have that connection in, in order to understand how we can best preserve them <clears throat> and understand the importance of, you know, of the ponderosa, of the tassel-eared squirrel, and that these are not just trivial topics, you know, that, you know, that get in the way of our economic development. You know, this, our economic development is intrinsically connected to these trees and these animals. And I, I just think uh, uh, people, what you, w the work that you've done and the teachings that you've done at NAU is just, I can't commend you enough. So thank you so much, Sylvester. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Hope to talk to you again. Thank you, my man. Appreciate it.